right, so I think we're streaming. Here's it's in the news. I ran across this last night. Intestinal worms throw open the door to dangerous viruses. Uh, paper came out, really looked at uh, infection in rodents of West Nile virus, and they saw that if the rodents had a nematode inside of them in the gut, it made them more, more susceptible to the viral infection. I should say more damage of the viral infection. Uh, interesting to note that it seems, I haven't read the paper, but based on uh, the news reports, it seems like the worm itself is inducing some change in the immune response of those intestinal cells, making them more likely to exhibit the severe pathology, which allows then the virus to get deeper into the host. Instead of just infecting surface epithelial cells, they're going, they're going deeper. So I thought that was pretty, pretty cool. Another parasite in the news. All right, so um, just a couple things to wrap up. Um, don't forget quizzes. Uh, I think we have at least a quiz. Two quizzes, I think monogenes and eucestodes. Um, we'll see about the cestode stuff. Life cycles. A bunch of life cycles, that's for sure. We are here. Talked about the life cycle of death. So first, uh, any questions? Uh, I also went through and looked at the lab quiz number one, online one. You know, three times that I went through and made changes on grades based on spelling. Uh, so those should, those should be up. We're going to record the highest highest of the grades. And I think what we're going to do this week in labs to look at those pictures and just kind of review the answers, what it was pointing at, so you, so you have an idea of if you're wondering why well, I don't understand some of the arrows and what they're pointing to, I'll give you my philosophy on, on labeling. I will also have a quiz in the lab um, that's 10 questions, but that's kind of gives you a closer how well do I know this without having the word list in front of me. Um, Yep. Yeah. So I'll get it set up, and then you have to take it before you leave. Uh, but no, again, on Monday, Wednesdays after class at five, so you can't like can't start at a four fifty, and then and later and you have to be done. So we'll get that set up. Um, still planning for the practical next week. Uh, as far as the lecture exam, the the plan was to have it on Friday, but depending on today. We may ultimately decide that to move it, and then I would make an announcement. And it would be next week, not on a Friday, but it could be like a Tuesday or Wednesday. And you'll have all day to take it. So that way, there's no. You could take it early in the morning, you could take it late in the evening. All right. So we talked about diphilobotherium, we did the life cycle. All right, and what we didn't do is talk about adaptations yet. This is a pretty cool life cycle, if you ask me, because there are quite a few adaptations, or this life cycle represents several adaptations to increase transmission, or increase probability of transmitting to, um, to the next host. So we're going to start off with our fishing mammal. We said you know, our Fishing mammal consumes a fish that has this pleurocircoid in it, all right? And then the increase in temperature it is what triggers the development of the worm. And that's, that's just one of those adaptations that allow, that tells the parasite, I'm in the host that I need to be, or at least in the appropriate homeotherm, or at least a homeotherm, because of this possibility, right? If a fish gets eaten by another fish, Point of the temperature is going to be much lower uh, usually. So it says, okay, well, I didn't find, get into the right host. Let me just migrate out and, and remain a plural circle. Now, this mammal, the adult's in the small intestine. And what we see is that we have a large number of eggs that get released over a very short period of time. So that it's basically synchronized egg release.
So in terms of synchronizing, we're synchronizing it with the life cycle of the host. We're dumping a ton of eggs into the environment all at the same time where our intermediate host is going to be most abundant. So our copepod hosts, they increase population sizes in the spring and then they tail off uh, late summer and fall. We want to, if we're trying to increase our, our transmission to these guys, we want to have the eggs get released while these guys are still out there. So if you're dumping a small number of eggs over a long period of time, yeah, you're going to increase your chance that you get there, get into a host. However, you get into these copepods that are fairly short-lived, only a few months is about all they live. Some of them, one month lifespan, that's it. So you need to get in there and then have these guys get consumed by a fish. So we dump them eggs all out at one time, one short period of time. They go out into the environment, and then the eggs aren't going to hatch until they get their light. So hatching is light dependent. There's actually two wavelengths. Is that it's looking at? Why are these wavelengths? Well, good question. But I think our question here is why light? Eggs are coming out. They're coming out in feces. It doesn't do you any good to hatch while you're still in that pile of feces. So these eggs have to get out, and the eggs know that they've gotten out or in the anthropogenic sense. They know they got out by sensing this light. So this is an adaptation to ensure that we're not hatching before we're actually out of that dung heap. Right? But that's not the only thing. Our core city is very short-lived. Right? It's an active swimming stage, and that's just like any of our other ciliated stages that are swimming around. They're very short-lived. For the coracidium, they only live about 12 hours. So to increase our chances that the copepods will consume them, they exhibit negative geotaxis. What does that mean? So we know what taxis is, right? it's an attraction. What about negative geotaxis? They move away from the third. They move away from the Earth. Do you know what they're sensing? Water. Magnetic fields. Gravity. So they're moving against gravity. Which, you get the same response as positive phototaxis, but it's a different stimulant. So if you have positive phototaxis, you shine a light on one side and they all swim towards it. But negative geotaxis, they're going to swim up. They're going to swim up. So you can kind of take them out by like generating your, your own gravity, mind you. But yeah, they swim up near the surface. Why do they swim near the surface? Because that's where copepods are feeding. Copepods are feeding up in the, in the water column, up near the top. They're going to be feeding on other uh, smaller organisms, other uh, plankton, zooplankton. So we've got synchronized egg release, hatching that's light dependent, needs a source of light and negative geotaxis. All of these things working to try to increase your, your transmission success. And then probably the other thing is this, use of paratenic hosts. Because what we're doing is accumulate our parasite into these larger hosts. This again. You might only have one or two pleural circulates in a small bait fish, but those bait fish are getting consumed by larger fish, which is going to increase the number of pleural circulates in this fish. So, and what you end up happening is you're seeing an increase in the percentage of fish that are actually infected because of the accumulation effect. All right? Questions? All right, so that goes into fishing mammals. 
and it does exhibit some pathology. All right? So in the fish, the main source of pathology is going to be the movement, the migration of these prosarcoids or the pleurosarcoids into the flesh. That can be a source of pathology. In humans, we don't necessarily see that. There are some exceptions. Though. So in terms of the pathology, we're going to talk about the adult worms right now. So in the adult worms, if you get it, you're going to usually be asymptomatic. You're probably not going to know. All right? Eggs come out, you're not going to see the eggs. But sometimes you will exhibit some sort of fatigue and some sort of weakness. That's pretty common with a with tapeworm. And a, and a lot of that is just kind of inflammatory response. You, your body sees it and fights it, and then you just kind of feel blah. You feel this malaise. The important thing is that this parasite can produce something called pernicious anemia. All right? So anemia is decrease in size and hemoglobin content of red blood cells. So you're not transporting oxygen as, as well as you could be, as well as you should be. All right? And we, you're probably most familiar with iron anemia, which is anemia due to low iron content. Pernicious anemia produces the same types of symptoms, but it's due to a lack of vitamin B12. All right. So we need B12 for nucleic acid metabolism and for red blood cell maturation. Unfortunately, this tapeworm is going to absorb 80 to 100% of all dietary B12 that, that, that you're ingesting, which means you're not absorbing it. And if you're not absorbing it, you don't have it for nucleic acid metabolism or red blood cell maturation, which means your red blood cells can't mature. You start to exhibit anemia. Now, near almost all cases of pernicious anemia tend to be in Finnish people. So it seems to be some sort of genetic component going on here. And it's not just Finnish people, but also some of their descendants are also susceptible to this. Other types of B12 inhibitions would uh, you know, manifest, manifest the same type of symptoms, which weakness, fatigue. Low red blood cell counts, uh, low they, oxygen saturations. Are they like identified specifically in like Finnish people, like the connection that's, that's like causing them to be more susceptible than other people? I don't know. I want to say that I think part of that is they tend to be less able to absorb low amounts of vitamin B12. Because again, the tapeworms are going to suck up up to 100%. They can still have a small amount. They might have something, some genetic that, that is hindering their ability to absorb the B12. But yeah, it's pretty likely to get it. All right, so that's the adult. Diphilobothrin, <coughs> just in general, too, could produce a larval. Now, this is it's possible. Is, would diphilobothrium do this? Probably not. It's not diphilobothrium latum or diphilobothrium dendriticum, but there could be other diphilobothrium species that do that. And it produces something called sparginosis, which is a human infection with a pleural circle. All right, it's difficult to ID larval stages in general. So much so that you typically can't even get it down to species. Sometimes you're lucky and you can get, get it to genus. And then if you know some other things like hosts in the life cycle, maybe then you can get it, you can get it, get it better. But what this sparginosis is, is basically the pleural circle embedded in the tissue. And usually in humans, it'll be like just subdermal infection. So you can actually see it in lungs, like this one, right in the eyeball. Not the, not the nicest thing, cutest thing. This is one of these, you know, of all of the nightmares that, that I have, minus the one where I like wake up and I, I realize that I'm not just late for class, but like I haven't been going to class for the last several weeks and we've got a big midterm. That's a, like the worst. The, the next nightmares are looking and seeing parasites in my eyes, <laughs> all right? Or seeing them come out of my nose or my mouth. That, that's the, 
nightmare number two. All right, so how do you get this? Uh, you can get this a couple different ways. One is accidental consumption of copepods pods with procercoids. So going back to our life cycle, if we had accidentally consumed some of these, it's possible that that, that pleural circoid uh, migrates or develops into a pleural circoid uh, in our muscle. And again, highly unlikely to be dendriticum or latum, probably some other diphilobothrium species. Second way is if we act kind of as a peritonic host. So if we eat uh, these hosts, insufficiently cooked amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, that all have pleural circoids, it's possible then that we can get it. it again, it just migrates into our tissue. So you know, raw snake is popular in China is it can cure a variety of illnesses, or at least that's the belief. Uh, and that's where you see some of these is in China by those individuals practicing you know, like herbal medicine. Some would call it witchcraft, but you know, it's uh, ethnomedicine. Would that be, I think the, pro, the, the term ethnomedicine. Like it's, it's like, like two ethnic groups. Yeah, you know, passed down. I, I can't imagine what it would be. I think probably the grossest one is this third one, where you have the pleural circoids that are alive in flesh, and then you use that flesh and slap it on an open wound, and the pleural, pleural circoids actually move from that dead animal into you. All right, so you know when does that happen? Pulse is a split plug frog or flesh of vertebrates applied to skin ulcers or inflamed vaginas or eyeballs. I mean, that's, again, another, you could say, a home remedy uh, that, that was, I mean, some people believe in it. You know, if you watch uh, baseball season get getting underway, you watch uh, the sand lot. You know, kid gets hit in the eye with a baseball and they slap a big steak over his eye. Now imagine if there was pleural circoids in that steak. It's possible that that pleural circoid moves into his eye and it's a completely different movie at that point. All right. <laughs> So uh, pathology is subdermal lump, lumps, minimal, minimal. I mean, you'll get some inflammation, but usually it's, it's minimal other than these, these lumps. So they look, they look odd, they, they feel odd, uh, and so forth. Um, I will note that proliferation, so taking these pleural circoids and asexual reproduction could happen. So you get, you get one, and then you, you start getting more and more and more. But thankfully, in this group, that is rare. Proliferation of these larval stages is, is fairly rare. Others. Parietal pleural. There's your spark, uh, pleural circoid in there. Um, you can see some other images. Uh, typically, it would removal would be surgical in order to see these things, get these things out. And again, it's you're looking at you know pleural circoid stage, depending on how big you know it could be big, it could be fairly small. All right. Is there any way to get rid of the autism syndrome? Uh, I mean, you, I don't know. I believe surgery is the first response. All right. Next order, cyclophilidia. So this is the order that's by far the largest. We have the largest number of slides from this order. All right. Members of this order have acetabular skulls, usually with four suckers. In this group, the parenchyma is clearly divided. We're going to have a distinct medial region, so interior region, and then we have an extensive cortical, you know, outer area. The vitellin gland is going to be compact. It's going to be single, and it's going to be post ovarian. At least in our species sides that we have, our ovary is going to be bilobed. And then posterior to it, you'll get this dark staining structure. That is the vitellin gland. 
right? And in contrast, we've seen middle areas being these small, small structures that all have, like branched tree, you know, where each each uh, middle and gland is that bud of the tree. Not so in these. It's very single. It's it's single. It's compact. With the scolex, we typically have an armed rostellum, which means we've got this structure at the top that has hooks. Could be, could be movable, could be, you know, inverted or retracted, or it could be fixed. And again, we have slides to see these armed rostellums. The general pore in our pseudophilidians was midline, usually midline. General pores here are all lateral. They're all on side, one side or the other side, or in some worms, they alternate, regular alternating or irregular alternating. So you might have two or three on the right side and then one or two on the left side and so forth. And I think we do have, I've seen it, I'm trying to remember if we have a prepared slide for this. Most of these tapeworms are in birds and mammals. That's their definitive host. Ready? I would definitely bring the handouts to the lab because I've got these diagrams. All right, family, we're going to talk about family Tineidae. We're going to actually talk about a couple of parasites in this family. This contains the largest, or this family is the largest of the cyclophilidians. This family also contains the most medically important tapeworms that we have. Just like our, our cyclophilidian order, all right, our ovary is going to be bilobed, we're, we're going to see that. And our metacesto, so our larval cesto, our lar larval tapeworm, is going to be some type of bladder worm. So the worm's going to have some sort of bladder associated with it. And it's going to be notable that these, these metacestodes, they're in mammals. So our mammal host is going to be an intermediate host, and then we could have some other mammal as a definitive host. And again, I, we, I have the diagrams because it shows we have tinea in the lab, so you can kind of see the structure of the proglottids. Uh, <clears throat> especially the, the, the reproductive system. The Tinea species is one that we're going to talk about. And there's two species. All right? Fortunately, there's a life cycle that's similar for both uh, Tinea saginata and Tinea solium. All right? So Tinea saginata is called the beef tapeworm. Right? It's called the beef tapeworm because it uses cattle as our intermediate host. This one's probably the most common human tapeworm that's out there. Right. Tinea solium is the pork tapeworm. Why is it called the pork tapeworm? Because pigs are the intermediate host. This is probably also the, the most dangerous human tapeworm that we have. And it's most dangerous because humans can also serve as an intermediate host. And that's where we get our, our significant pathology. There is differences between them. We can kind of focus on identifying or being able to distinguish between the two on slides, but we don't we don't have different ones. So just kind of know uh, as an FYI, yeah, Tinea saginata lacks a rostellum. Tinea solium does not. It has an armed rostellum. Also, Tinea saginata is much bigger, much longer than Tinea solium. And no, just like up to 20 meters for, for saginata. I mean, the length of this room. That's pretty impressive for a table. Pretty impressive for coming out, out, out of a, a human. Right. Yep, I'm going to leave it up because we've got to go through the life cycle. All right. So, life cycle similar. Really just kind of comes down to that intermediate host. Who can serve as an intermediate host?
right, so we are diagramming life cycle tedia. Right, these are human human parasites. So our human is going to be the definitive host for us. All right, our adult is going to be in the small intestine. Which is what? Well, the pergoda drops off. Right, the pergoda detaches from the strobola, travels down, and exits the host in the feces. So we have a gravid pergoda that exits the host. Now, these pergoda still have their musculature intact. So what's going to happen? is this gravid proglottic gets out and wiggles around outside of the host. Until it gets out of that feces, gets out of that dung heap. Once it does, then it is now exposed to the environments where it then desiccates and ruptures. Wiggles around, dries out, and bursts. All right. Once that happens, we now have our egg that is in the environment. So you can imagine, you've got this pergola, and it's fairly sizable, comes out in the eggs, and it's actually going to be moving. The egg then can be spread by flies to various parts. So just think, if you're out having a picnic at a park, and you're seeing flies landing, just flying around, they land on your food. Just think, they could have been at a dung pile where they're picking up teeny eggs and dropping it, depositing it onto your fresh lettuce that you're about to consume. So you consume the egg, or at least the intermediate host consumes the egg. Where? Our egg then hatches to release the oncosphere. So that is in our gut. It's in our gut. It burrows into fat and muscle tissue, where it develops into a cystic surface. Cystic surface larvae. All right, what makes this bladder worm is that this is the circus has an inverted scolex and then you've got this bladder behind it all right that's our cystic circus type now our intermediate hosts just kind of depends on the species So cattle or pigs slash human. So cattle for tenia saginata, pigs and humans for tenia soli. Once we get to the cystocircus stage, then we can consume it when we ingest undercooked, undercooked meat. Raw meat, beef tartare, anyone? Pick it up that way. Now, once we get inside, how does the cystic circus know that it's inside? Uh, bile salts. That's what triggers the vagination of these scolas. Scol okay. All right. The bile salt triggers evagination. Okay. We're, we're producing it. And that triggers development to the adult.
And when do we start shedding eggs? Anywhere from 2 to 12, 12 weeks after we ingest that cyst surface. Now, if you cook the meat, you're good. All right? Cooking will kill these parasites, no problem. So question on team. Sorry, the major adaptation here is the fact that these proglottids actually have muscles, intact muscles, and they can wiggle out, wiggle around, and get out of that. Uh, not just get out of the, the feces, but actually move off of that feces, possibly onto vegetation. Vegetation that our cattle or pigs can feed. All right, so. We talk about this, Tinius aginata and Tinius oleum, because of their pathology. The pathology that we're going to see depends on what stage of the parasite. Are we infected with the larval stage, or are we infected by the adult? So if we're infected by the adult, generically it's called tinnitus. And its pathology is going to be similar to any other large adult tape. So most of them are asymptomatic, and then occasionally you have these moderate, minor to moderate symptoms, which could, could include oops, next step, which could include dizziness, fatigue, abdominal pain, Dizziness, abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea, intestinal obstruction, loss of appetite. This intestinal obstruction really just, you need a lot. You need a lot of tapeworms to, to do that. A lot of tapeworms tend to produce that loss of appetite as well. Right. This parasite, though, doesn't appear to cause the B12 deficiency. It doesn't seem like it absorbs all the B12 like diphilobothrum later does. So if you have, you know, these types of symptoms with your B12 deficiency with your pernicious anemia, you know it's diphilobothrin. All right, but if you don't have that pernicious anemia and you have just these symptoms, you could have adult, you could have any of the adult tapeworms. You could possibly even have some of the, the nematodes as well. Now there is one added thing, and it's not necessarily significant physiological effect but more of a psychological effect. And that is, how do you respond if you see these proglottids and they're actually wiggling? Because there's nothing that says, it has to wait until you actually defecate. Those proglottids can find their way out their own. So if you can, uh, I don't know, just a tingling sensation or a movement, a funny feeling, and then all of a sudden you look, Take a, take a glance and you see a wiggling proglottid. Like, oh man, what's the psychological effect? And nematode can also do something like that where it could come out. Again. That sounds like the tool for nightmares. Right? It is, yes. So, I told you, it's, it's not going to hurt you, you know, physi physiologically, but gosh, emotionally, that is freaky. That is freaky. All right. So that's the adult. Real bad one. It's if you get the larval stages. So if you accidentally ingest these eggs, then what will likely happen is that you develop a disease called cysticercosis. And that's infection with the cysticerca or the cysticercus larvae. All right. Now, this is only for teneusolium. We can't. We're not going to get infected with tinea saginata. So this is strictly tinea solium. Now, your symptoms and the severity of these symptoms all depend on where those cysticerca go. Where, where does that oncosphere burrow itself and get to and then develop the, this into the cysticercus? So if it, if it insists in like skeletal tissue, uh, skin tissue, and liver, or the fat, you're going to likely have minimal pathology. You will have some pathology, all right? Especially if you go like a skeletal system. If it, if it finds its way in the, in the bone marrow, 
you can have a possibility of, of having uh, some necrosis happening just due to the pressure buildup. Same thing with like the liver, all right? But it's going to take several in that same place. You're going to have to have several in that same place to do that. If it goes to the eye, then you could cause blindness, all right? And that specific one is ocular cysticercosis. That's what it's called. So the oncosphere goes there, develops into the cysticercus in the eye, and what ultimately happens is you're causing irreparable damage to the retina iris or the coral neck. Fix that too. Actually, what I should have done is download the new file because I caught these earlier. Fix all this stuff. Oh, all that I can remember right now. That irreparable damage to the retina iris or the choroid, and the choroid's just that vascular area of the eye between the retina and the sclera. So that's me, the head, anatomy. Probably recognize that term, or maybe that brought like nightmares to you. Saying those terms again. <laughs> All right, so blindness, uh, kind of bad. Uh, I'd say the worst is this last one. Neurocysticercosis, that's where our cysticercus will already develop in, in the brain. And unfortunately, it's rarely diagnosed except at autopsy. I mean, there are chances where you can see it, um, where they catch it, but a lot of times there's really nothing that we can do about it. So the symptoms uh, is seizures, cerebral nerve palsy, stroke, paralysis, and ultimately death. And this is just kind of a cross-section of a, of a human brain to show each of these is a circuit larvae. And that's in one section. So you can imagine, you've got all of these. Think of the, the uh, inflammation, the pressure that's developing. Ultimately, you know, you're having disruptive nervous signaling causing cerebral uh, nerve palsy and seizures. Uh, possibly then you start causing blockages, uh, leading to stroke, and then ultimately paralysis and death. I left off coma here. Coma typically uh, would precede this, this spot. Right, right with death. When you get when you're at that point, it's not a whole lot you can do. Now, as I said, it's rarely rarely diagnosed except at autopsy. However, if you have an adult that starts to exhibit epilepsy, that's typically the clue, especially if you don't have any family history of epilepsy. Because they say, okay, well, we know epilepsy is, is genetic or you know, a lot of them are, are genetic diseases. If you don't have a family history of having epilepsy you know, aunts, relatives, cousins, or whatever, then they could say, okay, let's let's investigate. Perhaps you have something going on like this, like neurocysticercosis. All right. This actually happened in Jewish population in New York back in early 1900s. Why is that strange? It's a pork tapeworm, right? And Jewish populations, they don't, Eat the pork, right? Mm -hmm. So when this popped up, they were really wondering what the heck's going on here, right? How, how do you think they got it? Say in this population, it was more affluent, more affluent Jewish population. Uh, no, nah, I mean, if you eat raw pork, you just get the adults. It's even worse than that. Their cooks, cooks and kitchen staffs were, weren't Jewish. Oh, they, were. they typically had, they typically raised you know, pigs or whatever. Pigs had it. They were infected. They were shedding eggs, and then you're preparing food, distributing the eggs. So, yeah, there is a... Uh, book is called uh, New Guinea Tapeworms and Jewish Grandmothers. So, if you're curious, it's entertaining to read. Uh, treatment. Yeah, we can treat this, uh, except in a few cases. All right, so typically you take some drugs, it'll kill off uh, the cysticercus larvae, uh, but there are exceptions. So ocular cases you typically can't treat. Um, with drugs because you'll like the, the death of those larvae will induce an inflammatory re reactions uh, and ultimately permanently damage the eye. 
Same thing occurs if it's in the if these are in the brain ventricles. So again, death will induce inflammation and ultimately kill the host. So you know, in those situations, in the ocular cases, they do have success in surgery. Same thing with the brain ventricles. Sometimes they go in and surgically remove them if they think that that would help the patient. Other times, sometimes they just look at it and say, look, you only have a couple there. They don't seem to be spreading. We'll monitor it. Uh, if it doesn't get worse, we'll, we'll just live, our, live your life. So, not, not, the, not the greatest. Questions? Uh, we got more images to kind of demonstrate it. So, you can see brain scans. Here, you've got your surface larvae. Um, some are more, so obvious, this is individual patient that's still alive. Uh, occasionally, you'll get calcification too. So you still have the same sort of stuff. Uh, and here are the larvae actually in some flesh. So you can see that they, they go there and they're, they're bladder worms. They are, they can be juicy. Your, your necropsy section. Let's see if we can. Not a big image, but you can see them, school seats and so forth. All right, so not the greatest thing to have. Speaking of another thing not to really have, let's talk about econococcus. So we've got tenia slides. All right. We also have slides of Econococcus. This is the smallest adult tapeworm that we have in this family. You're going to see, you'll see the entire tapeworm. That tapeworm consists of a scolex, an immature proglottid, a mature proglottid, and a gravid proglottid. That is it. This is the entire adult. Gravid proglottid will detach, and you've got a new immature proglottid that that forms. Right, so because of this, they rarely exceed five millimeters in length. Now, even though the adults are the smallest, juveniles can produce some of the largest larval cysts around. And it's those larval cysts that cause the pathology that we see in, in our host. All right, so we've got two life cycles. Uh, Econococcus granulosus and Econococcus multilocularis. Now, the life cycles of both, again, it's very similar, just like our, our two demon species. Very similar, it's just different hosts. So our granulosis, global distribution, our definitive hosts are going to be cats, dogs, um, some, uh, primary cats, and felines are secondary. Felines are secondary. But they're canid predators. Uh, Multilocularis, it's primarily foxes. So it can also infect dogs, cats, and coyotes, uh, but primarily foxes out in the wild. Granulosis, the primary, primary canid predator out in the wild, is going to be your wolves, your, your coyotes, the larger canids. All right, so for Econococcus, we have, again, Do one life cycle and then you can kind of fill in the hosts accordingly. So what we're going to do is have our canine. That's going to be our host, so the larger canine or foxes, depending on what species. Our adult is going to be in the small intestine. And as I had mentioned, we have amyloidic release of that proglottid. Right. Our proglottid ruptures on its way out of the host. So in the feces, we actually release the egg. Right. So the gravid proglottid gets released, detaches, ruptures on its way out, releasing the eggs. 
The eggs then accidentally get consumed by our intermediate host. And our intermediate host is a mammal of some sort. This is also a difference. So in our granulosis life cycle, our intermediate host is going to be a large herbivorous mammal. Think deer, elk, something large is going to be a prey item for a pack of wolves. Think of that. In multilocularis, it's going into foxes. One of their major prey items are rodents. The rodents pick up the egg. And what we have is we have our oncosphere. That's in our gut. So egg hatches, releasing our oncosphere. And then that burrows out into various tissues and forms a hydatid cyst. a hydatid cyst. Once we get to that hydatid cyst stage, then we can get consumed by our definitive host, where we start having development. Now, we start saying egg production in about two months. It takes about two months for our uh, hydatid cyst for the proboscolases to develop to the adults, to the adults where we start making eggs. And then our adults going to live five to 12 months. That's different for tenia. Tenia lives the years. So I will note in this life cycle. Those hydatid cysts could be considered a pretty significant adaptation to increase transmission. And the reason is because we have asexual reproduction that occurs at that stage. Right? It occurs in that stage. This hydatid cyst consists of a thick outer layer. And that layer is very resistant to the host response. Host responding is just like, hey, leave me alone. Uh, you know, you, you're not bother, more bothersome than, than damaging. All right, and then underneath that acellular, that non-cellular layer, acellular layer, you then have a germinative layer. It's real thin. And that germinative layer is going to be what generates a capsule. And that capsule is called the brood capsule. So this layer starts to form a pocket, pocket in pocket, and then inside that pocket we have additional budding that happens to produce these guys, which are protoscolases. So you've got a brood capsule that arises from this germinative layer, and inside of that brood capsule we're going to have about 10 to 30 of these protoscolases. Each of these protoscolases can give rise to a single worm. So you went from one egg to produce this hydatid cyst that could have millions of these protoscolases inside of it. All right. Now, these things can, can pinch off, the stalk can break, and then these brood capsules settle down at at the bottom of this hydatid cyst. Those structures then is what's called hydatid sand. It's just a collection of root capsules that broke free, their stalk broke, and so forth. So if you can imagine, this thing's germinative. I mean, it's reproducing. And that means the cyst is going to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So you start off from the size of an egg, and then it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger inside of our mammal host. What's happening then? What does the mammal host have to deal with? Increased weight, increased pressure, slowing you down, making you more likely to be consumed. And then if you think about why this thing even evolved, well, think about your canine predators. At least for granulosis, those predators typically hunt in packs. 
They make the kill. They share in the kill. One large deer that has one of these hydatid cysts could potentially infect the entire pack. That's a pretty big advantage. So uh, what we'll do is we'll talk more. Difference between our multilocularis and the granulosis in terms of the hydatid cyst is the type of hydatid cyst that they produce. So we'll talk about those on, on Wednesday. And yeah, I think what we're going to do is we're going to postpone our test the next week. And I think we'll probably do Tuesday, Wednesday. Instead of one day, I'll probably let you get, give you two days to take this exam. That way, we'll, I know we'll finish all of this on Friday. So you've got the weekend and you'll have Monday to answer it, to ask any questions before the exam goes live. And we should be good. Okay, let's do that. I would, I'd rather give you guys an extra day or two to start this material. Thank you. All right. Got my app. See some of you in lab. So the lab session will be like identifying structures like what we have for. Yeah, yeah, identifying structures, identifying life cycle stages, uh, and it is up to the system. So we'll look at system instead. Should have also said, I get I made a I have great scope open. So you, I don't know if you had a notice that you were automatically enrolled, but those lab Quizzes, I'm just gonna scan them in and let grade still handle them. I still have to check groups, but we'll try that and see how it goes. So 